Thank you everyone for coming. I am glad to be here. Um, this is Mitra Mehran. I am a Fulbright Scholar at um, Bush School of Governance studying policy analysis. I will give a very brief one, uh, one and a half or two minutes um, overview of the status of women in Afghanistan in general. Then I will introduce the panel. Um, they will discuss in details the challenges and opportunities um, that um, an average Afghan woman is going through. Um, <clears throat> despite persistent insurgents and terrorist attacks, um, Afghanistan has made um, considerable progress on women's rights since 2001. Um, girls can go to school, young women to universities, uh, where they sometimes even share classrooms with uh, men. Obviously, United States um, has been one of the leading donors and supporters of these processes. Uh, Ms. Laura Bush has been one of the strong advocates for Afghan women too, and everyone knows her and appreciates her, even if you go to the very um, local areas. In the current government structures, we have two female ministers, uh, four ambassadors, 69 National Assembly members, uh, which is 28% representation thanks to the quota, um, nine deputy ministers, two district governor out of 375, which is very low. 2% um, of Afghan women makes the National Army Forces. Um, 12 women members in High Peace Council out of 70 members, but unfortunately they are still not in process of negotiations with insurgents or Taliban. 39% um, of almost 9 million children enrolled in schools are girls. One of the most encouraging advancements uh, that happened recently was the gov Afghan government adopted a national action plan on June 2015, it will, which will implement un the United Nations Security <coughs> Council resolution 1325, um, women, peace, and security. As I said before, still we have not had any women in peace negotiations table with Taliban in formal meetings. However, um, I'm glad we have Dr. Nilofar here. She was one of the first two women who went to one of the um, negotiations um, discussions with Taliban. However, members of Parliament are opposed to pass the elimination of violence against women law since 2009, and still they, they resist to do it. The Afghan judiciary said that it had registered more than 3,700 cases of violence against women and girls in the first eight months of 2016. And also global rights estimate that almost 90% of women experience physical, sexual, or psychological abuse or forced marriages in Afghanistan. Now I want to introduce our panel. Um, Dr. Nilofar Ibrahimi, she is a member of uh, the National Assembly of Afghanistan. She is representing Badakhshan province in the WC Jirga, House of Representatives. Her life history is one about survival, pursuit of dreams, and dedication to women's well-being and health. She is a medical doctor. Dr. Ibrahimi's childhood was marked by the number, by murder of her father and grandfather, also a member of parliament in the 1970s. They were victims of the communist regime. They were buried alive like many other regime dissidents. Their bodies have never been found. We have Farhad Pupal. Farhad Pupal, sorry, serves as the manager of the Women's Initiative Fellowship in the Afghan Women's Project at the George Bush Institute. In this role, Farhad is responsible for research and programmatic efforts that empower women worldwide to lead in their communities and countries. She has studied political science and international relations in history of the Near East at the University of California, Santiago. We have Razia John. She is founder and president of Zobli Education Center, has worked for many years to forge connection between Afghans and Americans. Born in Afghanistan, Razia moved to the United States in the 1970s. For two decades, she was the leader of a small tailoring business in Duxbury, Massachusetts, where she served as president of the town's Rotary Club. And then we have Sabrina Karim. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Government at Cornell University. Her research focuses on conflict and peace processes, particularly state building in the aftermath of civil war. Specifically, she studies international development and security assistance in post-conflict states, gender reforms, and peacekeeping in domestic security sectors, and the relationship between gender and violence. Her first book, Equal Opportunity Peacekeeping, won the Conflict Research Society's Best Book Prize for 2017. Now I want to uh, ask Sabrina to facilitate today's panel. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for turning out for this panel. Um, I just have a small announcement. Um, if you would like to promote this event on social media, on Twitter, we do have a hashtag, which is Bush 
B U S H W P S 2017. That's the hashtag um, on Twitter if you'd like to promote the event. Um, so what I will do is we will begin with a 12-minute introduction um, by each panelist. And then I have three questions and, uh, which have been given to the panelists in advance. And they were told that they could answer any one of them. And then we will open it up to uh, discussion afterwards to the audience. So um, we will, I think, begin with, I think we'll just go down this way, if that's all right. Sure. Um, and so you have 12 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kareem. And I'm honored to be here today with two women that I admire immensely for the work that they're doing for the future of Afghanistan. I wanted to start with just a very brief reminder of exactly why women's inclusion in <coughs> these processes is important and provide just a very brief overview of that in Afghanistan. But I'm sure that um, Razia John and Dr. Ibrahimi can speak to that at, at great length. Women's inclusion positive, positively impacts both the process and the outcomes of peace. Well, <laughs> we're talking about Afghanistan. What else is there? <laughs> <laughs> the building is shaking. <laughs> Add, added emphasis. Um, <laughs> There is empirical evidence that women's inclusion results in greater instances of reaching a peace agreement, implementing that agreement, and in the agreement's sustainability over the long term. Why is that? Because women promote dialogue and trust, they bridge divides, they mobilize coalitions, they raise issues that men may not, including prioritizing gender equality, human rights, justice, access to education, and health care. Women rebuild societies by breaking the conflict trap and broadening societal participation and empowering them economically can contribute to increased civil society activity and inclusive governance. We know that gender equality and women's economic empowerment are strongly tied to prosperous and peaceful societies. So not only is women's inclusion and peace building important for its own sake, it's important for the very success of peace. And this is important to remember. Women's inclusion takes place through a variety of mechanisms, and I think we've all heard of U UN Security Council Resolution 1325 that was passed in October of 2000, and it's the most widely cited policy framework for women's inclusion in peace processes. It calls for increased participation of women at all levels of decision making, including direct rep representation at peace talks, um, and there are a variety of other, of other um, aspects of, of that resolution. But other mechanisms include everything from observer status for select groups, consultations, inclusive commissions, problem-solving workshops, public decision-making, and mass action. A study by the International Peace Institute found that successful peace agreements always used a combination of different mechanisms in parallel and at different points in the process. So direct representation is incredibly important, but there are other aspects of inclusion that need to be considered. In Afghanistan, women's inclusion and influence in the peace process appears to be the most limited at the regional and national levels and the most robust at the local and family levels. Uh, as I mentioned, Dr. Ibrahimi and, and Razi Jan can speak to this much better than I can, but I did want to share just some brief observations. At the regional level, Afghan women have been almost entirely absent from delegations discussing peace and security in Afghanistan, whether it was through the quadrilateral coordination group with Afghanistan, Pakistan, China, and the US, talks hosted by Russia in February of this year, or in the launch of the Kabul process um, in June of this year, at which only two out of the 47 uh, were, were women. At the national level, Afghan women participate in, in inclusive commissions as members and as leaders, uh, but their role continues to, reign, to, continues to remain somewhat marginalized. A 2014 study by Oxfam found that in 23 rounds of peace talks between the Afghan government and the Taliban since 2005, one woman from the government was present on two occasions. No women were included in discussions between international negotiators and the Taliban, and it's unclear if or to what extent women's interests were represented by men. Women are included on the High Peace Council, um, as Mitra mentioned earlier, and two serve on the Executive Board of Advisors to, to the high, high Peace Council. But some have expressed frustration over their marginalized role, and in the past, the High Peace Council itself has had a limited role in direct talks, with many negotiations occurring behind closed doors. At the local level, Afghan women play a larger role in peace building through their, 
their participation on the provincial peace councils, which are present in all 34 provinces. And all of them but one include women. The women of the pro provincial peace councils have banded together in the past to petition the government, citing their significant contributions to the peace process at the local level and calling for greater formal representation in all aspects of the national level dialogue around peace. At the family and village levels, Afghan women perhaps have the biggest impact on promoting peace among family members and their community, the role in conflict mediation, building trust and dialogue, educating children, and counseling family members not to engage in violence are common themes across communities, and this role is often recognized by male members of the community as well. So in sum, peace necessitates women's inclusion at all levels, and I hope that we see improvement in that moving forward in Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we'll move on. To well, I yeah. forgot my papers as usual, <laughs> but um, I think um, what you said, the last part, and first of all, thank you for having us here. It's a great opportunity to really um, tell you that um, I think women in Afghanistan are just amazing uh, creatures. Um, they never give up and they always look forward um, for doing something either for their family or for the community. Um, they are the strongest souls in the world that I've encountered. Um, what I want to really tell you that it's two worlds, different worlds, as um, they were trying to tell uh, one of the speakers here that when he visited Afghanistan in 69 and 68, you know, the girls were wearing shorts and, and, and you know, I, I went to a private school and I wore skirts and I was riding a bike and, and I was treated as good as my brother. And my brother came to MIT and I came to Harvard. So there was no difference between girls and boys and you were treated the same. And unfortunately what happened and 40 years later, things are very different. And, and we went through hell and still are going through hell. So for us to really come out of those ashes, it's really difficult. And as one person, as each individual, we look at things that how can we make a difference? How small, you know that it's so unfortunate that the whole world used to look towards, oh, America. Mm -hmm. And now we are in a, in a, I mean, it was so disheartened to listen to you that what do we have? You know, America has at least lost how to gain this, it will take years. But our country in Afghanistan, you know, I think one woman can do things and one person can do things. And what I started doing is that, because I was privileged and I could not go back for 38 years back to Afghanistan. Once I tried through Pakistan and, and when I got to the border of Chaman, I saw these Taliban with beards and, and my nephew said, Khala, auntie, they'll kill you and they'll kill me too. And I have small children and I can't do this. And he was a refugee in Pakistan. So we turned around and left. But I did go back in 2001, 2002, actually January of it for the first time after 38 years. And, and I tried to look around and I tried to help different ways to really, and wherever I went, I saw that if you gave a toy to a boy and then in a village and toy to a girl, the boy would take his toy and then two steps when the girl started to go towards home, he would grab it from her. And if she didn't give, he would slap her and take it away and run away. And I would run after them and I couldn't do it. And I thought, God, we have to give education to these girls. Doesn't matter how small it is. That's where we have to start. So I looked around and I found this piece of land that is very historical because in 1920, Amir Amanullah Khan built the first boys' school in that village. Boys didn't have school. And this is almost 100 years ago. 
And then it was destroyed many times. And when I got to that land, it was nothing but a, just a wall. So we built this <coughs> girls' school with a lot of opposition because all the community wanted girl, boys' school. A gentleman, just very short, I'll just tell you that the first step, I'm standing for groundbreaking with 35 men, the malik, the mayor, the police chief, the, and I'm the only woman standing there. And one gentleman sends a message and says, um, tell Razia Jan if you really dig a, this with the bulldozer, we had a small bulldozer, I'm going to come and lie down in front of it, and I'm not going to let you build the school. And I sent in front of that 35 men, and this is 12 years ago, I said, if you come, I'll be so glad to bury you here. <laughs> and then put a flag and say, this bastard never wanted a girl's school. He never showed up. And we did build the school. <laughs> and the, 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 the amazing 10 years later, last year, the girls are graduating from our school and they are still not allowed to go anywhere. So we did again build a college next to it. And there were men too. And I had for the first time 200 of my students standing there next to these men. And I told the men, you are not going to speak till these girls speak first. And I said, after they say everything, then you can start praising us. <laughs> and they all stood there, and these girls, they recited the Quran, they read about the school <coughs> and what they're going to do next, and so and so forth. And after that, I told these guys, now you can speak. And the best thing, first thing, the, the, he picked up a stone, the mullah, he said, put it down, and he said, I hope and I wish that these girls would become prime ministers, become judges become doctors. And I was surprised. The change that they have, the taste of education that these girls have given to the community and changed the whole world for them, literally. We started with 101 girls. Right now we have 650 girls. And if I could afford, I could have two, 300 girls in kindergarten, which I can't. We have an institute for midwifery, English as second language, and computer science. Five of our girls are going to American University in Kabul. One girl got full scholarship to go to University of Istanbul. She left two weeks ago. So the progress we can do, one person can make change, and that's what we are training. I hope that my girls one day will be leaders like doctor, our great leader. And she will stand in front of these men and, and say, come on, <coughs> we can work together. And I'm here to stay. So I thank you very much. I uh, don't want to take your time, because I think time is very precious. And, and I think it's just, I hope that things will change. And, and, and we will once again become the leaders America, and then people can follow you. But I think there are other great countries that are supporting us, and, and I think they are taking the uh, stand for education and, and, and freedom of women in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that story. You're welcome. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim. Hello. Hello, everyone. A very good morning to all of you. First of all, I would like to thank the Bush School of Government and Public Service and Dr. Hudson for organizing this event and giving us the opportunity to share our perspective with a wider um, audience. I am also grateful to the <coughs> audience for showing interest in the subject and talking time to uh, attend. Now I would like 
to draw your attention to the presentation I have prepared for the event. قبل از اینکه با اصل پرزنتیشن برم میخوایم بگیم که ما نسل جنگ هستم با جنگ تولد شدیم و با جنگ درس خوندیم با جنگ در کرسی سیاسی آمدیم و در امی عمر تانستیم یکی از زنای اولین زنای باشم که در مذاکره در اولین میز مذاکره با مخالفین اشتراک داشتیم So um, she says before before starting her presentation, um, <coughs> she wanted to say that she is she was born and raised in war, and she is a product of war. Um, her interest to um, to be in politics was because of that too, and she is so proud. And she is so proud to say that she, she was one of the first two women that represented um, Afghan government and Afghan women in negotiation table with Taliban. Salah has did a Mohalifino, Mofakino, Motanafizini CSC, Musharakat CSC, what Joy Gohiz and under processal, the Sword Ho Cholish Ho, Wapish to Hododos for shot. Here she will uh, discuss mainly four points. The first one um, is different perspectives on, on peace, mainly what, what, what is the definition of peace for government, what it is for the opposition, and also what it is for the local elders and people at, at a very grassroots level. And the second one is um, peace uh, and rule of women in the, in the peace processes, um, achievements and challenges, and then she's gonna have some recommendations at the end. ما از جمله کسایی بودم که وقت در شانتی پاریس با پروسه مذاکره اولین مذاکره کننده های سال مذاکره را شروع کردیم قبل از چهار ساعت کس مخالفین و کسانی که با مذاکره آمده بودند به میز مذاکره با چادر خود از ما و خانم که اشتراک کرده بودیم روی گرفت اما بعد از چهار ساعت بعد از طرف غذا با ما شیشت و از خانواده خود قصه کرد so she was one of the first two women who participated in the uh, peace negotiation with Taliban in Paris. And then the interesting thing she says is, so the first when they entered to the room, the, the main, the leaders who were coming from the Taliban to the negotiation table put a scarf on their face because they didn't want it to see their faces. And then, but the interesting thing she says is that after four hours, they, they opened. They were not only like taking off the scarf, but talking about their women, but talking about their daughters, and even that her daughter is studying medical, um, going to medical school somewhere. I'm going to Norway, the Mozakri, the Taraf Mokobel Chortan, as Mardona, Avroni, Mohalifin Budan, who are Taraf, the Gahashtan, as Honomoy Budan, Jomi Madini Bud, Parlamor Bud, was here soon Budan. ما قسم صحبت کردیم که هیچ مسئله زشتی نبود که در پروسه جنگ طالب اعتراف کرده بود که انتحاری این منطقه را ما کرده بود و انتحاری فلان منطقه را دیگه کس و پدر کسان را که از دست داده بودن و عزیزای خود که کسان که از دست داده بودن در روش صحبت کردن اما زیبایی مسئله برای حضور زن در اون میزی بود که با مو فرهنگ افغانی این مردها خانم‌ها را می‌پذیرفتن که صحبت‌هایشان بشنوه و این یک نوع تغییر بود و این بر ما قابل لمس بودی تغییر شاید در اون میز اگر دو طرف مردم می بود و امو الفاظ تبادله می شد شاید با بوتل بالای یک دیگه احواله می کردن اما آنچه که مهم بودی بود که قدرت حضور زن در اونمو میز باعث ازی شده بود کنها تحمل کنن تمام چیزایی که ما می گفتیم and then the second negotiation, they, they went to Taliban, there was eight women, um, that she was one of them. And then she says one of the interesting things is in the table they had a lot of discussions about all atrocities Taliban are doing and directly talking to them that it's what they say is not really fair. But the interesting thing she says is because women had experienced a lot of those processes and then they were able to talk, talk to Taliban in a way that they underst understood it very well. And and took it at least easily. 
because the first thing is Afghan culture that they don't go violent at least in the table with women and the second interesting thing is that um, women had a lot of experiences that when they shared with Taliban or the way w a woman communicated is very different than a man because she says that all the claims and, and, and problems that was there and then we told Taliban, if that discussion happened between um, Afghan government, if, if there was men representing Afghan government and Taliban in the, in the communication we had, there would definitely be a physical fight between that two groups. But because it was women, uh, the perspectives was the different and the way we delivered was different. So that's why the result was mm -hmm. way different than, than the negotiations um, were before. تعریف جهانی از سال امیر تعریف میکنه که سال یک راه دراز و یک راه طولانی است نه بر یک سال است نه بر ده سال یعنی سال بر رسیدن به سال باید حوصله داشت و باید تحمل کرد و راه طولانی از ما نمیتونه ما روزو نداریم که به یک روز به سال برسیم سو ام د د دیفینیشن اف پیس انٹرنیشنلی از ایتس ا لانگ پروسس دت نیدز ا لوت اف ورک ان 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 and it needs to be institutionalized and it's definitely we, we are not going to get there in um, in a short time ba afghanistan cheeze ke besyar mohim ast is ke taraf jang az sal yak ta'rif mutafawat dara u ta'rif ta'rif taslim shudan ast na yi ke muzakara kardan balku no fikr mikran ke agar ma ba taraf sal barim ba ma'na yi ast ke ma taslim shudim however this is not the definition that the opposition group or taliban and other insurgents active in afghanistan have they believe peace is not a process uh, there is no way for negotiation, but it's more of a, it, it will be a, um, it's, it's, it will uh, hurt in their honor if they accept the, the suggestions or the proposals that comes from Afghan government. But the part that the government is working on the government of Afghanistan is the first year that it will be in a way of the government and the government of the government. So we have the High Peace Council in Afghanistan that is um, the organization that works as a bridge between Afghan government and the opposition. And its structure is what we really need there because that is, that actually bridges the gap and then um, provides opportunities. But it is not capable of uh, actually solving anything or mm -hmm. coming. و اپوزیسیون و منتقدین که است اونا حکومت در سرکوب مخالفین ناتوان فکر میکنن از خاطر باز هم دشمن فکر میکنه که ما حکومت باید به با ما روی بیارن نه ما با حکومت سو دن دیر از انادر پارتی دت از اپوزیشن سو دی دون بیلیو این نیگوشییشنز اند دن دی بیلیو دت ا گورنمنت شود گو این اتاک اور دیسترای توتالی دی انسورجنس سو دت از دی پلیس دت دن دی طالبان فیل uh, that it's, it should be Afghan government to come to us or, or something because they, then they don't like the comments that come from, from the opposition. As a part of the political participation and the presence of the women in the past year, we want to thank the world of the world. Of course, Afghanistan has been able to make a picture of the world of the world. Like the dear friend of mine said, we had a life for 40 years that was the same. اما بعد از چل سال وضعیت را که ما داریم این فرهنگ جنگ است نه تصویر افغانستان سو ام از وی سید بیفور دات ام افغانستان دات واز 40 ایرز اگو از رازی جان سید از وی دفرند این دن دا پیکچر وی هاف اف پیس این وی هاف اف وار از دفرند امان وومن تو ام یعنی با این منانه است که ما وقت که ما امروز از جنگ استیم ما می خواهیم که تشکری کنیم از جامعه جهانی، از کمک های جامعه جهانی، از امکاری های جامعه جهانی در بین پانزده سال که حضور ما در پارلمان به عنوان یک زن جوان از قله های کوی پامیر بدخشان نشاندهنده امکاری ها و مصارف و کمک های جامعه جهانی و بودن جامعه جهانی در کنار ما بوده بعد از یک کشور بعد از جنگ So I want to sincerely thanks the um presence and support of international community in Afghanistan. Definitely their role has, 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 they has played a big role in me being a parliament member and, and a leader in the capital coming from a very um, rural area says a lot about their achievements and the effects of their work. Mm -hmm. در ماده 22 قانون اساسی حقوق تصاویر یا حقوق زن و مرد مساویر ما داریم که یک دستاورد بنهایت کلان است. Legally, uh, 
we uh, women are protected in Afghanistan. Article 22 of the Constitution says that men and women are equal. However, there is two, uh, two things uh, about presence of women, and um, one is symbolic and the other one is, is not symbolic. اوی که غیر سمبولیک است تنها ما با کارت سرخ و سبز و سفید تانستیم که بقبلانیم بالای تمام ملت افغانستان که ما یک رای مساوی با مردها داریم The only thing is that is not symbolic is the voting So it's the woman no matter what has, has the full right to, to practice his voting right and then go and, and, and do that and, and she has an option and that's totally equal with the, with the with vote of a man. So there is no one, no man in Afghanistan to say, okay, your vote is half of my vote. So it's at least equal. But in terms of the symbolic part, but the symbolic part is big because even we have 69 parliament member in Afghanistan, but we were not able to pass um, elimination of violence against women law yet. We are still not able to have any woman in, uh, in the um, Supreme Court. Well, as body jangi. وقتی که جنگ تعریف میشه اولین آسیب پذیرترین جنس که هست زن است به خاطر که او خواهر است مادر است دختر است و خانم است and then in war um, in general and also in afghanistan so the, the, the victim of the immediate victim of war is women because their sisters mothers and then anyway they are they, they are victim به این خاطر ما دادخواهی میکنیم که امو قسم که اولی ناسیب پذیر هاستیم باید اولویت داده شود در اشتراک ما در حضور فیزیکی ما به صورت معنادار و واقعیش در تمامی مذاکرات So that's why we are doing advocacy that women should be given rule in, in decision making processes their rule should not be symbolic only ما در حمایت دولتی امروز افغانستان بعد از عبده سال باید از مرحله آمار و ارقام بیرون شده باشیم بیایم به مرحله بهره برداری و عملگرایی مثلا ما در شورای سال در حکومت وحدت ملی تعداد زیاد شده ولی این مهم است که چقدر تأثیر گذاری داریم ما و چقدر در عمل ما تانستیم تأثیر گذار باشیم ما از مرحله ارائه ارقام و آمار باید تیر شده باشیم یک قدم پیشتر به عملگرایی و تأثیر گذاری ما صحبت کنیم after 17 years, it's the time that we should go for a real change in the ground because we should, we should not um, rely on data only that we have 60 women in parliament or we have um, how many women we have in Peace Council as long as they don't have a say or a voice in actual decision-making processes or they are not an active social and political actor. <coughs> ما چی دستاورت ها داریم میشه بگیم که ما زنان افغانستان به او پختگی سیاسی رسیدن و همچنان از امایه جامعه جهانی در مقابل زنها بوده ولی چالش ها چی است تبیز جنسیتی در برابر زنها وجود داره بخاطر که So uh, we had a lot of achievements but obviously there is a lot of problems um, there and there's a lot many different types of discrimination against women only because they are women. تبعیض جنسیتی در برابر زنان وجود داره باورمندی به حقوق زنان از طرف مخالفین وجود داره و برخوردهای سیاسی دوگانه وجود داره. So the the one of the other main thing is that um, oppositions do not believe in women's right at all and then also in political in in high leadership political um, sphere there is um, a dual perception or perspective about women. So, but I have a lot of people who 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 have
So the first thing is government should promise that when they have the action plan of 1325, they should promise and be committed to delivering those promises. اما این همیشه که ما تنها بر صدا کشیدن ما افغانستان باید از افغانستان شهری به افغانستان دهاتی تعریف بتیم ما افغانستان تنها افغانستان شهرهای کلان نبینیم افغانستان دهات باید ببینیم که در دهات چی مگذره so it is to do that it, it is very necessary that we go to the rural areas Afghanistan is not an um, urban country so most of people are living in rural areas but Everything that has been done so far is limited to cities. It, uh, it's only mainly the women in cities who has been in power, not in rural areas. So it's not, it's not possible to see sustainability if, if, it's, if it goes through. We don't have to change the life of Afghanistan in the city and the city of the city. We have a place in Afghanistan, we have a place in Pakhtia, we have a place in Pamir, we have a place in Konar, that we don't have a place in the city. هنوز به تاریخ کمون اولیه تبادله اجناس به اجناس است یک جنس میتن برنج روغن میگیرن We have never been able to in, in the past 17 years to touch the life of a rural woman so recent documentaries by BBC published says that uh, most of women um, in, in there are some parts of Afghanistan that they don't recognize the money they still exchange uh, their, the, the products they, they get from livestock to get something, clothes or shoes or something from other places. In the year of Afghanistan, if we are far away from the women, in Afghanistan, there are two parts of Afghanistan. One is a political war, and one is a internal war. For the political war, you can see that in terms of the geographical position of Afghanistan, Afghanistan هر فرزند افغانستان که شهید میشه به خاطر رسیدن سال در خانه های جامعه جهانی اولین قربانی اولین سپر هستن به خاطر که ما با توریزم جهانی می جنگیم So there is two levels of war in Afghanistan What is the regional one and international one that we are fighting against an international terrorism It's, Terrorism in Afghanistan is not a, risk, a threat to Afghanistan too But there is also um, local insurgents that we are fighting with and then that affects women at different levels very differently. اما بود داخلی ما ما نیاز داریم بعد از اینکه به یک پختگی سیاسی رسیدیم با 40 سال جنگ پیشنهاد ما یست نیازمندی مردم افغانستان است که افغانستان از شهر به دهات برود. شاید در حکومت داری شما بهترین الگوا و تجربه ها باشین تغییر نظام مرکزی با نظام فدرالی با نظام ایالتی با نظام صدارتی و پارلمانی یک نیاز است که بعد از چل سال جنگ باید بر ما تجربه شده باشه که شاید ما بعد از ده سال آرزوی زیر داشته باشیم که ما تغییر نظام میخواییم ما برزی میخواییم که نظام مرکزی و نظام دهاتی تبدیل شود و ما شاهد تغییر مثل کشورهای شما البته در امون مرایل ابتدایش باشیم so the only way that the, maybe the final recommendation is the only way that we can keep um, the peace and make it sustainable is we, we decentralize the system. The system is very centralized. That's why a lot of women and men in general are not touched in rural areas. And, and she believes that is the only way uh, that, that we can empower women and, and give them the right to make decisions about themselves at, at rural re level. برای زیک زندگی زن افغانستان تغییر بخره بایگیت عده حقل سر امود سواد ابتداییش کار شوه برای دراز مدد و برای توانمنسازی اقتصادی از اونا کار شوه اونا خودشان بافندگی دارن چه قسم ما میتانیم که کار دستی صناعی دستی و زراعت از اینا را انتقال بتیم برای بود اقتصادی تا ای که اینا اول تعلیم و تربیشان تغییر شوه دوم توانمندی اقتصادی پیدا کنن and then the only way to get out of the situation and help women is provide them at least with primary education and empower them economically so they have their own income. Zan Afghanistan is a very different world. If I am a mother, I am a father, 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 and I am a father, I am a father, I am a father. Women in Afghanistan are different creatures with all the problems they go through, but they always stand. And then she lost her father when she was two years old. Um, she is here because she had her mom to, to empower her and to help her. Thank you. Thank you.
and she says sorry for taking too long. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Um, thank you very much to the speakers. Um, so we have 10 minutes, but I just want to pause for one second and kind of note the, this moment. Right? We have four wonderful women here um, who have traveled here all the way from Afghanistan, a few people. I had the wonderful opportunity to speak with them at dinner last time, and their stories are, are actually in incredible. Right? Um, Farhat here, she came here when she was three months old and is pursuing a career to advance you know, a homeland that she hasn't really necessarily known, but it's, it's her goal in life, and that's, that's amazing. We have Razia, who her, her story is just incredible too. She told me last night that she went back to um, Afghanistan for the first time after 9-11 um, because she wanted to help rebuild the country. Right? And obviously we have heard um, a lot from Dr. Ibrahim about her story and how absolutely incredible it is that she can be here today with us to share um, these recommendations and also the story. You know, we hear a lot about the importance of local peace building. We need to hear local voices, local, the voices of women, and this is exactly what we're hearing. Um, and so I think it's wonderful that, that we get a chance to actually uh, be a part of that. Um, and then I also want to note Mirza, who is here on a Fulbright um, in, on her last year, and uh, is hopefully really wants to stay and uh, go into international development, but is, is a little worried because of the situation right now. She is, you know, from Afghanistan. And so uh, she doesn't know if she'll be able to stay, um, but would like to, like to be able to contribute to her country um, by being here. So um, I just wanted to pause for a moment to, to note the kind of really importance of, of these women being here. Um, before, uh, so I, I actually, the questions that I had um, have kind of been an, um, answered. So I actually want to go straight to the audience um, to take some questions so that we can um, have some time for that. Oh, hello. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> Ma'am, is it good? If America is already sending over manpower in the form of military because peace negotiations aren't working, but then war is not working either, what's the next step and who's going to fight continually for the girls that are still there and, and, and trying to obtain your, your goals for, for further improvement in the lives of Afghan females. Would, who would like, um, can open it up to whoever would like to answer first? I think, I think the basic thing is that, um, uh, you know, that education is such a key to any country's prosperity or even surviving. Um, as they say, you know, you, you educate a boy and you educate a boy. But if you educate a girl, you educate the whole family, you educate the whole community. So I think that is the basic thing. Uh, with all the war and terrorism and all the things that are going in that country, I think the only um, way that we can see um, a success is giving education. And although there are a lot of failures because of Taliban and them burning schools and, and you know, and destroying schools and poisoning girls and, uh, but still, you can't give up. Uh, you have to continue uh, what your mission is and what you want to really succeed. And hopefully, one day there will be peace. And to, to answer the part of your question about who's going to fight for the rights of women in Afghanistan, women like Razia John and, and Dr. Ibrahimi are fighting for the rights of women in Afghanistan, and there are countless others like them in both urban and rural areas who work for local civil society organizations, who are members of parliament, who um, are health care workers, who are educators, who are fighting day in and day out. And you may not hear about it on, on the news on a daily basis, but I guarantee you, you they're out there and they're working really, really hard. Did you want to add anything? Or we can take the next question. Yeah, 
Okay. Hi, thank you so much for being here and your time. Um, my name is Catherine, a master's student here. I wanted to ask, in the midst of the challenges that are faced during the turbulent times, um, and you even gave some examples, several of you have uh, stories of the challenges that you faced or opposition of, even the man who said he'll lay in front of the bulldozer. Um, in those kind of situations, being that there's high risk of torture or death, how do you navigate it, and what are some of the opportunities you're using to navigate those kinds of challenges to help others? Um, ما کس استم که در زمان طالبا در شپخانه کار کردیم. So I was working as a medical doctor under the Taliban regime during that time. درس ما خلاص نشده بود، اما ما باعث رضاکار و شپخانه کار میکردم. Even that I was not done with my education fully, but I was working as a volunteer during that. یعنی به این معنی است که مانع میشه. ما وقت ما مبارزه میکنیم مانع کار نیست ما باید مبارزه کنیم so that is about fighting for that so there is always obstacles but it's but it's has how we can take all those risks to go for that ما یک دختر یتیمی بودیم که اول خانواده ما باید قانع می ساختم که ما به یک ولایت افغانستان میرم درس می خوانم so even it was harder for me to convince first my family to get out of my province and go to the capital to study medical school بعد از اینکه درس خواندم باید در جریان طالب کار میکردم پول پیدا میکردم که هم درس میخوندم هم کار میکردم so under the Taliban regime we had to I was working there so to gain some money for myself um, اما وقتی که ما هفت سال میان زنان رفتم کار کردم در بین مردم کار مسلکی کردم بر ما امو زن بی سواد بی سواد و کسی که از حق خودتا نمیفهمید پاسداری میره کرد که ما هفت سال در خدمتش بودم آمد به مرای دار so the, the change is when I used to work for seven years as a medical doctor with local areas, it was women themselves who came and vote for me. So they, they do it. They go for the things they think, <coughs> if they have the opportunities, uh, that can change the things for them. Yani ma meitane, ama ma natana chalish daakhili khuda darim ka ma chalish geografiya wa mantaqa wa basat dunya chalish darim bina baram maqiyat geografiya wii ka darim. So yeah, there, there, there is always women who can and, and fight for that, even, um, even like um, the, even like the geographical area we are located, there is a lot of this international tourism and geographic location that make it even harder for us. We <coughs> don't have to fight only with our local politics. But, <coughs> but it's proven that women can with all the problems. Hi, my name is Maria Suarez. Um, my question is, how do you work with women who are maybe afraid or who aren't ready for maybe their girls to go to school or don't believe that maybe it's their place? Um, or do you find that most women are ready, do think their girls should be going to school and do, things that, do think that they should have the same liberties as men? Um. I think I think what it is that uh, women always want things for their daughters, uh, and they always want that their daughter's life should be better than what they. Uh, and if it was in Afghanistan, if women had really a say, a real say, in a family that they marry the ten-year-old girl, I think they will be the first one not to allow it. Uh, and if they have a chance to educate that girl, uh, I think they will, they will try to um, help that girl really get education rather than 10-year-old getting married and having a child. I think mothers, um, and I think in, in, in our society in Afghanistan, um, when as the woman gets older, she gets more, I think, say. I think a grandmother can really help a child, a granddaughter, more than the mother, because she has gone through everything, and she has gained that respect among her family, sons and daughters, and she might say something <coughs> that they, they will listen to. 
at the same time, I was working with different local NGOs. So it's, um, it's local NGOs that make sure that they adapt the culture there. We provided, for example, um, uh, services in a way that is that the women feel more comfortable, or even if the mother wants, but if the father doesn't want, then it doesn't work. So, um, so it's like local women and uh, the, the work with the with other local women. So I think we should recognize the role of local NGOs that, that are active there, and and I think they deliver the services in in a, in a very adaptable way. Afghanistan. <laughs> باید از بین خودشان با تجربه اب ده سال و پانزده سال کس دیگه نباید پروژه ها در مراکز و در بیرون از افغانستان تراحی شوه باید در بین مردم بروند و با اطراف بروند و از ضروریت های مردم پروژه ساخته شوه تطبیق شوه مثلا ما شورای انکشافی داریم در تمام ولایات افغانستان او یک شورای تقریبا آیداتی می باشه اگر ما کمک ها مشروط بسازیم برای که تمام شورا باید زن باشه رئیس های شورا مثلا در دایکندی ما یک گلایت است که شورایش که زن است اونا بسیار موفقانه کار میکنن با تعهد کار میکنن نسبت در مناطق که مردا رئیس شورا هستن یعنی ما وقت پروسه میسازیم باید به این رقم ارزیابی کنیم شی از سینگ این در پاس 17 یارز ومن هست گاد در کپاسیتی و کپابیلیتی و وی هست در رسورسز ویتن در ومن دمسلس بر در تینگ از هاوی کن میک شر One of the examples is there is uh, development communities across Afghanistan, and one of the solutions <coughs> can be if the international community requires those, com those developing communities to be hated by women, and that is the one of the things that we can empower them, and and they have the and they have the capacity to uh, to lead that and to to run these those development communities. Uh, so that's all for the questions. We have two minutes left, and I would like um, our panelists to maybe give um, a the 20 seconds on, um, you know, what, what do we have, um, what's the hope that you can leave us with in terms of what's, what, what inspires you every day to keep working on what you do? I personally, when I see my own, I see my own, I see my own, I see my own, هیچ چیز زندگی را ندیدن اما امروز در فضای سیاسی آمدن سیاست میکنن ما توانمندی و علاقه و موچی را که میبینم انگیزه که در ما وجود داره ایست که ما هیچ وقت خود از بین برده فکر نمیکنیم فکر میکنیم که هستیم و باید قدرت سیاسی و قدرت درونی خود را پیدا کنیم و باید به پیش برویم It's the women around me that inspires me every day with all the problems I see, but then see the commitment they have and the, with the, all the energy and the belief that they can change something, go for that, <coughs> makes me to work every day. تونست سر ما کار کنم ما به هیچ برسم ما مطمئن هستیم که میتونیم زندگی هر هر یک فرد که ما تغییر بدیم میتونیم که تغییر به جامعه بیاریم because when i see myself where i come from i i do believe in this that if women have the opportunities they can become and go anywhere they want to wonderful i think uh, my my really focus is that how to reduce the marriage of a girl 10 and 12 years old and I've been successful. I have 18 girls who are engaged and they are still going to school. And I've got their in-laws and the parents together that they will graduate. I have eight girls that are married and they are going to school. And three of them are graduating this year. So it is something that I'm, you know, in government schools, once a girl is engaged, she cannot go to school. Once she's married, forget it. They, they will not allow it. But I do, because I want these girls to get education really as long as they can. And now, what is happening, that the girls who are married, they want to continue to do the midwifery and even go to other universities, because I think the, the in-laws have found and the husbands, you know, they have found um, the, 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 the taste of, for them to help the whole family, really. You know, one of the gentlemen who was engineer, he got married to a 12-year-old girl. And he came to this village, and he came to me first time, and he's a young man, 29 years old. And he said, Razia Jan, 
I want my wife, she was in seventh grade. Please put her in school. I don't know, she's a little child. How can I play with her? She has different ideas. I can't deal with her. What can I talk to her? And that gentleman has been with us for past seven years. And he has, she said, all at night I do is sit with her and do her homework. You know, after she does her chores, because the in-laws want her to do everything. But at night, that's the time. And she's going to graduate now. So it is something that we are changing. How small it is, but I think woman is the power in a family, no matter what you say, that they will bring the change, really. And if we educate these girls, if you educate a girl who's even three grades, she will always look when she's married to put her daughter somewhere to get better education because she can read and write. So I think this is what, and um, Afghan women are so brilliant. They are so smart. They are a thousand times smarter than, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> They're yeah. brothers. Oh, I agree. <laughs> So I think it is, it is, it is a, it's a struggle, but we look forward, we can't give up. And people ask me, why the hell do you do? You don't have to do this. I said, you know, if I don't do this, I'll be dead. You know, I have to continue this, because this is, if I can change the life of one girl, that is amazing for me. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this is what our mission is. And this is what we want to do, service above self. I'm a Rotarian. I don't know if you know anything about it for 25 years. And that's all we do in the community and internationally. We try to help. And I think it's something that it, you, it becomes your blood. You can't, you can't change it. You have to do something for somebody. Always think of good things for people. So I think that's what we... We are all here for and for you guys to listen to us and, and, and really get the lesson of. Um, all the time I tell my kids in school, always I say, if you can't help a child or your friend, don't hurt them, don't be abusive. Don't say a word that would hurt them or don't push them. Or So I think that's, that's what we are here for. Um, to help these girls, and I, I think it, it's a, it's a, it's a like this. You see the, hear this noise and scares you, but again we start smiling and we start talking um, because I think nothing can stop us. The mission this young woman is, you know, she came from a. I understand her point of view. What she went through um, was so difficult, and for her to stand up now and be a leader and to really, really work with the other men, which is, I know, not, you know, if a woman says, used to say, in 2007 I went, Women's International Day and a, a parliament member woman said something, they came and they picked her up and threw her out. Because she was not allowed to say what she wanted to say. Mm -hmm. But it's not happening anymore they will pick up a man and throw them up. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. what we want, really. That's the strength. Excellent. So. On, on that note, uh, we do, we are two minutes over. So do, if you have any no, quick I comments, that is, uh, <laughs> I, we uh, are out of time, unfortunately. So if you would welcome again um, an applause for this wonderful panel. Thank you.